Well, good morning, Lake Springs Church. How is everyone this morning? All right, well, um, if you would open your Bibles to, I forgot to write it down, that page right there, 455, and the blue Bibles on the seats in front of you, and if you have those uh, Psalm scripture, scripture journals, uh, they're page 82. So we're going to be reading Psalm 46 today. All right. Verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war seas to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. All right. Everyone have uh, what we like to call summer traditions. You know, you got things that you do for maybe the 4th of July, Memorial Day when summer's kind of ending. Um, I know... Uh, that my family has some traditions, and one of these traditions is that me and my dad, and sometimes my sister as well, if we are the only ones in the house around mealtime, uh, we watch The Simpsons. <laughs> Bet you didn't expect a Simpsons sermon illustration today. <laughs> um, so we started this tradition uh, years and years ago, but we decided to start from the very beginning of the series, um, back when Disney Plus first came out. And so we've stuck to this so much now that we're in season 24 of the show. Yeah, it's it's been pretty awesome. Um, So about a week ago, uh, me and my dad, we watched a couple of episodes. And in a particular one, Homer, the doofus dad, uh, has a particularly rough day and is kind of distraught and depressed. His house is falling apart uh, due to the rain. His car gets towed. uh, His dog is sick. Uh, He's having just one of the worst days of his life. And so Lisa, his smart daughter, uh, tries to cheer him up, and she enters a raffle, um, which actually, Homer wins, and he gets a uh, MyPad, as the Simpsons call iPads, (laughs) and everything Apple is Mapple, one of my favorite details. Um, And so Homer loves this thing. He's overjoyed. He spends all his time with it, Um, He's using it before he goes to bed, while watching the baby, while in the car, (laughs) driving the car. And it's just become this obsession to him, and he he cannot sit still. And so one day, he's walking Maggie, and uh, the baby, and he crosses a street and falls into a manhole. And his MyPad shatters into pieces. (laughs) gasp. So now, Homer is not just back to being despondent, but it's worse. It's this thing that he had that kind of brought him out of a time of just sorrow, and now it's gone. His hope is lost. So the question is, uh, this morning, what do you put your hope in? What is it that you cling to most tightly? What is the thing that you can't live without? Let the answer to that question linger in the back of your mind as we walk through this psalm together today. So Psalm 46 is a reminder for times of anxiety and stress. It talks about incredibly stressful things happening. In the time of these psalms, it was normal for cities to be besieged, to have The city that you uh, lived in be attacked and then the walls come falling down, it was was a pretty scary thing. 
Uh, Jericho is probably a good example of that. The psalmists are using poetry and imagery in describing mountains falling into the seas. But in modern times, you know, the equivalent, don't we have bombs that can do that? Can't whole cities be more than just besieged, but just completely destroyed? So the psalmist is using this idea of earthly cities and falling and contrasting it with a heavenly city. Verse 4 says, There is a city whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. When an earthly city had a, uh, a river running through it, it would kind of allow agriculture, uh, fishing, and facilitating trade with other cities. But another benefit of it was it actually made it harder to besiege. If a city had a supply of running water, it made it more difficult for invaders to take the city. And so what the psalmist is saying here is that the kingdom of God has a river, and that river is God's spirit. It's the power of God. Jerusalem is a city that does not have a river going through it. But back in this time, it had God. God was the sustainer of life in Jerusalem. So long as God lived among the people, the city was invincible. But when Jerusalem abandoned God, they were no longer protected and conquered by the Babylonians and Assyrians. So what this means is that while our earthly cities can be destroyed and conquered and besieged, the kingdom of heaven cannot. So what does that mean? Well, all of us live and are citizens of some city. Uh, I'm a citizen of Apex. You may be from a citizen of Holly Springs or Fuquay Arena. But every Christian's true citizenship is in the city of heaven. Familiar phrasing, you might think. Philippians 3.20 uh, says, For our citizenship is in heaven. So on earth we have benefits of being citizens, such as, you know, being able to vote, having access to health care, public schools, and perhaps maybe if you aren't born in the United States and you want to be a citizen, you have to take classes, you have to fill out some forms, you have to wait for a long time. And it's a lot of work to try and earn your citizenship. And even after that, it's not guaranteed. But for the Christian's true citizenship, you don't earn it, and it is guaranteed. Your name is already written down in the kingdom. The rights and benefits of citizenship on earth can all be taken away, maybe by a war or a plague but the citizenship and the benefits that you have in heaven, the Lord says, cannot be taken from you. So what are those benefits? So an enlightenment, sorry, an enlightenment era preacher by the name of Jonathan Edwards said in his first sermon that we have on record of him when he was just 18. <laughs> I winked with the wrong eye too. That felt <laughs> Uh, basically, his three points in that sermon were about Christian happiness. And the three points to it were, your bad things will turn out for good, your good things cannot be taken from you, and the best things are yet to come. So your bad things will turn out for good. In Romans 8.28, Paul says, uh, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Which is great news for us Christians, what Paul is saying here is that all of our sin, all our misdeeds, our misguided ambitions, our dirty secrets, will all ultimately be redeemed and used for God's glory. It's not just we who are redeemed through our faith in Christ, but all of the sin and weight that we carried is ultimately going to show the glory of God to all creation. And Edward's second point, your good things cannot be taken from you. Well, what are your good things? Well, you're justified through faith. You are adopted and now are a child of God. God's no longer your boss or your king or the scary figure, but he's your father. You have the Holy Spirit in you. These things can't be taken away from you. They are yours to keep for eternity. And of course, the best things are yet to come. 
The worst thing, I think you'll agree, that can happen to us in our lives is that we die. It ends. But of course, for the Christian, that just puts us right into the Father's arms. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, To live is Christ, and to die is gain. So there are lots of stories about uh, Christian martyrs. Uh, all but one of the first apostles were martyred for their faith. All the torture and pain, it was worth it to them because they weren't afraid of what death would do. One of my favorite stories uh, from the old church uh, is that of St. Lawrence. So about 200 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the emperor of Rome decided he was fed up with these Christians. They were too much. And so he ordered that all the priests, all the bishops, and all the deacons were to be executed. But one of his prefects, or his advisors, said, hey, wait a minute. Before we kill them, we should probably have us, or probably have them give us all the money from the church. And so that's what they did. Rome gave Lawrence three days to collect the, uh, the riches of the church and then present them to the prefect of Rome. And so Lawrence spent those three days gathering all the riches of the church and then distributing them everywhere to the poor and to the needy in the community. When the day came to present what he collected, he presented a collection of poor people, blind people, widows, and lame. He said to the prefect, Behold, in these poor persons, the treasures which I promised to show you, to which I will add pearls and precious stones, those widows and consecrated virgins, which are the church's crown. Now, the legend goes that the prefect, well, he was very angry with this, didn't like that. He ordered a giant gridiron to be placed over hot coals and then for Lawrence to be flopped on top. And you thought North Carolina summers were hot. But the best part uh, of this, if there is a best part, was that Lawrence's final words were not that of regret or praise or wisdom. He said, turn me over. I'm well done on this side. <laughs> <laughs> because death was nothing to fear. Lawrence did not fear death. He even made a joke about it. And we don't have to fear death either. We have hope and happiness in Jesus Christ, who even when it seems like the world is ending, he is our refuge and our strength to get us through such times. That is what Psalm 46 is all about. Now the psalm starts with verse 1, with the idea that God is a mighty fortress and our strength. Now Brian said this last week, Something that trips people up a lot in the faith is this false idea taken from a verse out of context uh, that God won't give you more than you can handle. Because he absolutely will give you more than you can handle. For the reason that you can realize this is too much for me to handle and give it back to God. <laughs> because run back to the fortress so that you can have the strength to go whatever, through whatever trial comes your way. Because life is hard. And if it doesn't feel that way for you right now, I've been told, just wait a little bit. Jesus guarantees that we will have trouble, but not so much trouble that it will separate us from the love and protection of God. Because our fortress, the one who shelters us from the enemy, has not, does not, and will not abandon us. Refuge and strength that not only protects us, but that truly loves us. No weapon forged can harm us. No lie can tear us down. No tragedy can truly sink us. Nothing can overtake our Lord. And the greatest thing about that is that even when we fail, when we mess up, we can always come back to our Heavenly Father. Uh, Martin Luther, the famous Protestant reformer and as many uh, students know him, the 95 Theses guy, wrote a hymn all about Psalm 46. Did you know this? Many of you know, uh, or may know, uh, the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It was written by Martin Luther. 
And one of the verses of that hymn says, and forgive the old language, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel and hate, on earth is not his equal. So what Luther is writing here in the last part of the verse is that even though we have a loving God, we also have an evil enemy. An ancient enemy who hates God and hates believers and is armed with a lot of power. On earth is not as equal. No human can stand up to him on their own. Our power as human beings isn't enough to withstand the enemies alone. The devil works in ways he's already worked in before. Oftentimes he works subtly, trapping people into sin. Other times he's not so subtle and takes things that we don't want to let go of and shouldn't have to let go of, like loved ones, homes, health. And sometimes it's enough to get us angry at God, like, why would you let this happen? Can't you stop this? Why do I have to suffer all of this pain? I know many of us have asked those questions. You may be asking them today. Maybe you're close to losing hope. Things don't seem to be improving. Is God even listening? But here's what the psalmist offers. The psalm begins to conclude in verse 10. He says, be still and know that I am God. What an odd thing to ask. It's quite the juxtaposition to the first nine verses, you know, where God's destroying things left and right, and the mountains are falling, and nations are rising up. And God just says, be still. He's saying, in the midst of all that I am doing, everything that moves and shakes around you, be still and know that I am God. Know that I love you. Know that I work all things for good. Know that I know you inside out because I formed you in your mother's womb. Know that out of love I came down into the midst of all the mess of sin and destruction that you created and I loved you despite it. I loved you so much that I paid the full price of your sin and everyone else's on the cross where I was murdered. Be still and know that I am God. Now, it isn't easy to be still, but I want us all to focus all of our attentions in the next few moments trying to remain perfectly still and sitting with God. I'm going to read this psalm in its entirety one more time, and I want us to think about God to let the words wash over us. So you can get comfortable close your eyes, do whatever you need to do to focus everything that you have on stillness and being with God. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. 
the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Whatever problem it is that you came to church thinking about, be still. Whatever milestone you fear you won't hit, be still. Whatever hope or fear you have of the near future, be still. Know that Christ is Lord. How did that feel? <laughs> I just love those last two verses. In our Summer of Psalms series, we've had a, a, a memory verse or verses. Um, and in this week, I want us to memorize verses 10 and 11. My hope is not that you memorize it for the sake of putting it in your brain, but that you get called back to it when you need to stand still. Okay, so let's do this together. First read through. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. All right, let's take away some words. All right, one more time. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Take some more words away. Just kidding, we're doing it more. <laughs> he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. All right, now in Morse code. <laughs> Think you got it? <laughs> All right. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for the sacrifice that your son made on the cross so that we could gather here, that we could worship you, that we could be with you, that we could learn to become like you so that we can do what you did. Lord, we thank you for these moments where it seems like everything is too much for us. That we can't jump the hurdle. But Lord, you provide us with your words that we can be still and recognize that you are sovereign. You are God. And you love us. You love us so much that you 
would be our refuge and our fortress. And at the end of the day, you'll be exalted among the nations and in the earth where you deserve to be. In your name, we pray in awe. Amen.